I'm all in favor of asking why questions. My point is only that we can't demand that there be an answer that satisfies us, right? The universe is not set up for our amusement. There might be answers to any particular why question, or there might not be. So I think we need to sort of look at the kind of question we're asking. For example, the early universe has low entropy. That's where the arrow of time comes from. I would like to know why. And the answer might just be, it just is that way. It's a brute fact. Welcome to Closer to Truth. I'm speaking with Sean Carroll about his terrific new book, The Biggest Ideas in the Universe, Space, Time, and Motion. What I love are the equations. No, I'm serious. And readers will love them too, I promise. Sean, it's great to see you. Thank you very much for having me back, Robert. And you've had many years at Caltech, but you're now in Baltimore at Johns Hopkins University, the Homewood Professor of Natural Philosophy, a joint appointment between physics and philosophy. Perfect position. As soon as I read that, congratulations. Was it, was it a big decision? Well, it was a big decision in the sense that it affects my life a lot, but it was not a hard decision. This really is the perfect uh, position for me, and they like really crafted it to be exactly what I wanted. It's the first time in my life that the things that I want to do are exactly the same as the things my employer wants me to do. So that's a very good feeling. Well, John Softies is my alma mater, so I'm all thumbs up. Go Blue Jays. Let me, uh, let me give a, a, a Sean's quick bio in terms of his research, because he has focused on cosmology, field theory, and gravitation, shifting more recently to foundational questions in quantum mechanics, such as origin of probability, emergence of space and time, and statistical mechanics, entropy and the arrow of time, complexity, emergence, and causation. He is the author of several best-selling books, including The Big Picture and From Eternity to Here. He is the host of the popular Mindscape podcast. Sean, we have lots to cover on the biggest ideas in the universe, but let's start with those equations. Stephen Hawking said that the reason he did not include equations in his popular books is that someone told him that for every equation, it reduced book sales by one half. So I did a little calculation. I'm going to assume your book has about 100 uh, uh, equations. I think there are a lot more, but 100 is easy to use. So 0.5 to the 100th power is about 10 to the minus 31st. And by this metric, assuming every star and every galaxy has a planet with 100 million or a billion people, no one in the visible universe could buy your book. But I'm betting that you will prove the equation skeptics wrong. In fact, I just checked. And even though The Biggest Ideas in the Universe has not yet been released, it is already among the best sellers in several physics categories. So you have falsified a Stephen Hawking conjecture. Uh, why did you include equations when nobody else does? Well, you know, there's different reasons why you might write a popular trade physics book, right? And typically you're trying to get people up to speed on some of the most fun, speculative, enticing research ideas out there. And that's usually what I do when I write these books. But the other thing is you might want to teach people things that we know, things that we are pretty sure are on the right track. People have done that a lot. I haven't really done a lot of it myself, but I realized I could do it in a different way by bridging the gap between the sort of metaphorical, allegorical, word-based explanations and really becoming a physics student. So the equations are there, but we don't assume that you go into the book with any mathematical knowledge or even love for the equations. Yeah, and you make a, a really important distinction between understanding equations and solving equations. Basically, you say that understanding equations, if you do some work, you can get in your book. Uh, solving equations, you might need eight years in, in, in physics. <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly right. And that's sort of the secret sauce to how we can do this. It's not just that I teach you Newtonian mechanics and inclined planes and things like that. Those are mentioned in there. But very soon, we're getting to what are considered advanced topics to physics undergraduates. Many of the things we talk about in the book aren't ever talked about or taught to physics students because we can go faster because we're just giving you the ideas. Right. Terrific. Well, what I want to do is go through the book and just give a flavor 
for uh, the kinds of topics that you talk about. And I'm going to be selective and, and ask you the kinds of questions that I was interested in um, because the, 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 my physics background was, was, was fairly minimal uh, from a, um, a formal point of view. I did my doctorate in, in neuroscience. Um, so, and I've been following these things, but the book gave me this sense of bringing the ideas with the equations. I've read a lot of physics books and I've missed the equations. I've tried to read a few fully equations books and not really able to follow it. So your book <laughs> really was, uh, was terrific. So I want to go through each of the chapters quickly and a couple of the ideas and, you know, it, please try to keep your answers short so we can get through a, a, a lot of ideas. I want to throw a lot of ideas. So first chapter was on concept. Conservation. And the question is, why begin with conservation? Why is conservation fundamental? And if it were not the case, what would be the implications? I was trying to get across the idea that there are these things called the laws of physics, which are patterns that nature obeys. If one thing happens, then another thing happens right away. The simplest possible kind of pattern is something just stays constant, the total energy of the universe or the total electric charge of the universe. So the idea of conservation took hundreds and hundreds of years to sink into the minds of physicists. But once it did, to me, that was really the birth of modern physics. You talk about it being the first step in the transition between pre-modern to modern science. Yeah, exactly. You know, before we had modern physics, and by modern now, we don't mean quantum field theory, we mean Isaac Newton as modern physics, right? Before then, it was a story of natures and purposes. You know, we tend to anthropomorphize the physical world a little bit. And it was really took a long time for people to realize that things would just keep moving if we didn't prevent them from moving. There's not a natural state where the rock sits at the bottom of a hill. It wants to keep moving. It's friction and dissipation that get in the way. And that really opened up a whole new way of thinking about the world. What are the kinds of conservation that we talk about? I know there's energy, momentum, angular momentum. So or organize that for us briefly. Yeah, exactly. And I think that momentum is the first one I talk about. It was really the first one to be understood because if momentum is conserved, then, like I said, an object moving in a straight line will keep moving in a straight line unless a for force acts upon it. So it's not trying, it's not wanting to move in the straight line. That's just its natural thing. And then once you have that, you realize there's something called energy, which is kind of like momentum, but it's a number. It doesn't have a direction like the momentum does. There's angular momentum, the amount of spin we have. And then at a higher level of abstraction, there are things like electric charge, which is not really something that was known to Galileo and Newton, but today is really at the heart of all of modern quantum field theory. You also talk about the conservation of information. Did I get that right? You did. You did. That's a different kind of thing, but absolutely crucially important. And again, a huge break from pre-modern physics, because what it's saying is the information in the universe is preserved from moment to moment in the sense that in principle, and by the way, this is an idea they had in the 1800s. It's not necessarily true because we don't know what the fundamental laws of physics are. But the idea is, if you knew everything in the universe, in principle, that determines the entire past and the entire future of the universe. The amount of information is conserved from moment to moment. Now, you did, did I read this right, that you say that in an expanding universe, energy is not conserved? Yeah. The slightly more elaborate version of that is once you have general relativity, Einstein's theory of curved space time, it becomes hard or at least ambiguous to define what you mean by energy. If you just do the straightforward thing, take the energy of the individual things in the universe and add them all up. That's something that would be conserved if you are not in an expanding universe. When you are in an expanding universe, it is not conserved. We know that just because as the universe expands, photons lose energy because they redshift. They go from short wavelengths to long wavelengths. Their energy goes down. Deal with it. <laughs> okay. You, you, in the first chapter, introduced the, uh, uh, a, a concept that appears throughout that is an important one. It's, you call it the spherical cow joke. Uh, tell us the joke and why it's important. So a farmer, a dairy farmer, wants to optimize the milk output of his dairy cows. For some unknown reason, he visits the local physics department. He asks for the physicist, the theoretical physicist, to analyze his milk production. And the physicist comes back and says, okay, step one, we imagine a spherical cow. 
and the joke, that's the whole joke. That's it. <laughs> I didn't promise it would be funny. It's just illustrative because two reasons. Number one, that is the way physicists work. They idealize the situation to make it easier to analyze. Number two, that works in physics. It might not work in dairy farming. Cows are not spherical and the ways in which they are not spherical might really matter for your milk output. But when it comes to planets moving around the sun, you say, okay, let's think about one planet ignoring the others, right? We'll put the others back in later as perturbations. That's really just the paradigm for how physics is done these days. Right, and and if you're doing the gravitation of the sun, it's, it's a point in the middle of the sun rather than analyzing all the coronas and things like that. Yep. Chapter two is on change. Um, so tell me about the transition from cons uh, conservation to change. What's the difference? Well, conservation is something remaining constant, not changing. <laughs> and change is the opposite of that. And, and look, let's be honest. Change is something that is a vast topic that we talk about in all of the chapters of the book. But the specific thing I wanted to sneak in there in that chapter is the idea of calculus. This was the technological, if you want, advance that really enabled Isaac Newton to go as far as he did with classical mechanics. He understood the mathematics of change by thinking about how we can zoom in very, very close and say that, okay, change is an accumulation of things over time. So you can think of it as one moment to the next, to the next, to the next. But what do you mean by the next moment? Is that like a second later, a plank time later or whatever? <laughs> So he invented the idea of an infinitesimal time later, and that opened up the ability to both study the rates of change and the accumulated amounts of change in a rigorous mathematical way. And the definition of those two last phrases uh, is the rate of change is the derivative uh, and uh, the um, amount of change is the integral. That's exactly right. And I... I tell you what those mean. I give you the symbols for them and we go through some very, very simple examples. And as I, as I emphasize over and over again, and you've already exactly pointed out, the idea is not that hard, right? The symbols look a little unfamiliar, so they become scary. That's one of the reasons why I have a hundred equations. A hundred is much better than 10. Yes, like, if you yes. just have 10 equations, they're just sort of magical interlopers that you can ignore. But when you have 100, you get familiar. You're like, oh, yes, I know what that means. So both derivatives, the rates of change, and integrals, the total amount of change, those are things that are completely understandable. Yeah, and, and those are super important to really understand uh, physics, uh, modern physics in, in all its aspects. And others kind of avoid it because it, they sound scary and reminds people of the mathematics they either didn't like or didn't take. Uh, but I, I love the way you talk about it. You, in, in fact, you have two short phrases. I'd like you to explain a little bit because you talk about z derivatives as zero divided by zero and integrals as infinity times zero. So I, I actually hadn't heard, heard those aphorisms before. So give me some sense of that. Well, this was the whole advance that Newton and his... Uh, I don't want to say collaborator, because that's certainly not true. His rival, Gottfried Wilhelm von Leibniz, who also invented calculus, what they both did was invent a systematic way of making sense of the idea that, for example, for an integral, for the total amount of change, you could say, well, how much change is there in this interval, then the next interval, then the next? If you have a finite time interval, you can easily divide it into a finite number of sub-intervals and add them all up. And then you're taking a finite amount of change multiplying it by a finite number. But if you go all the way to a perfect representation, not just a crude approximation, the intervals get smaller and smaller, their length becomes zero, and the total amount of change naively is zero, but there are an infinite number of them. So you're <laughs> adding up an infinite number of accumulated changes, uh, each one of which is zero. Now, if that's all you say, it's nonsense. You can't do that. Any mathematician will tell you that's not well behaved. But what Leibniz and Newton figured out is there is a way to take the limit, as we say in calculus, to smoothly go from finite reasonable approximations to the exact quantity, even though that exact quantity is sort of spiritually or morally zero times infinity. Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's, that's a great way to, uh, to understand it without having to solve anything. <laughs>
I did not ask you to solve any integrals, do any derivatives, nothing like that. Right. <laughs> so uh, in, in the chapter on change, you start with uh, Laplacian paradigm. So briefly tell us what that is, because I want to trace the paradigms as you go through the book. Well, this is where it really comes to pass that information conservation matters. So it was Laplace in the year 1800, so over a century after Newton, but he figured out this really crucial implication of the system of mechanics that Isaac Newton had put forward, namely that if you knew the position and the momentum of every little bit of thing in the universe, and you knew Newton's laws, then you could figure out what happens in the future and the past. So how do you do that? That's the Laplacian paradigm. And the idea is you take the state of the system right now, and you use the laws of physics to say, how do we move it forward one infinitesimal moment in time? And if you know the answer to that, which Newton's equations tell you the answer to it, then you can just iterate that. You go from one moment to the next, the next, the next, the next, and build up as an accumulation, the entire past and future history of the system. So that's the Laplacian paradigm, the idea that we can take information at any one moment of time and use it to move forward and backward and figure out the entirety of the history of the system. So that chapter starts with that, and then you go back and I'd like to do, do a little bit of the history because you do it so well uh, with Kepler um, and the uh, breakthrough that the ellipse was the planetary orbit, and then Newton and why Newton was so important. We got to give those guys some credit before we move on. Absolutely. And one of the fun parts of writing these books is always to pull out a little historical anecdote that you don't hear over and over again. Like, you know, I've read a lot of these books and I've heard most of the standard ones, but just the idea that, you know, at that time, it was the age of reason. It was when coffee shops became really popular for the intellectuals to gather in. And people like Robert Hooke and Christopher Wren and Edmund Halley would like go to the coffee shop after a meeting of the Royal Society. And they would debate like, you know, what kind of force law would explain Kepler's laws of motion? And they finally worked up the courage to ask Isaac Newton, who explained it all to them. And that, that it's so much fun, but it's also educational and pedagogical because that move from Kepler to Newton is a move from saying the whole orbit of a planet is an ellipse, right? That's a sort of holistic statement about the entire trajectory. Newton doesn't say that. He says, if the planet's doing this right now, I'll tell you what it's doing a moment later. And that turns out to be an infinitely more powerful and flexible way of doing things. Chapter three is dynamics going from change to dynamics. What's the core idea of dynamics? Well, change is all the different possible ways we can imagine things changing, whereas dynamics is the way they actually do change in the real world. And this is going to, you know, throughout the book be an important theme. Like we can imagine all sorts of things and what the laws of physics do as patterns is pick out the right ones from all of them. And so the phrase, the, the title dynamics just means now we're going to tell you Newton's laws of motion for classical mechanics. And we're going to put it together to understand how things roll around in landscapes and things like that. So a couple of the points to open the chapter to set the position are no preferred position. Uh, what's the significance? Galilean relativity. So how do those two concepts set the framework to discuss dynamics? Yeah, you know, we attribute the idea of relativity to Einstein, or at least to the 20th century, but it, it goes far back. It goes all the way back to Galileo. Galileo, you know, is an interesting character because he really enabled all of modern physics, even though it was Newton who put it all together. Galileo was not as good at math as Newton was, but he was a genius. He was an Einstein level genius for thought experiments and insight. And figuring out what mattered and what didn't. So it was Galileo who really put the finishing touches on this idea that if it weren't for friction, things would move in a certain way. They would just continue moving on in a straight line. And furthermore, he realized he was trying to argue that the earth goes around the sun. That was an important debate during the day. Uh, why do we see the sun move? Well, because the earth rotates. And people said, if the earth rotated, we'd feel it, wouldn't we? Like it's pushing on us somehow. And Galileo said, no, because you're rotating along with it. You and the surface of the earth are moving at zero velocity with respect to each other, and therefore you feel nothing. That's where relativity 
comes in. You're moving at zero velocity relative to the surface of the Earth. Now, Einstein, et cetera, put the speed of light in there in a way that Galileo didn't, but this idea that there is no absolute measure of where you are or how fast you're moving in the universe, that's Galilean relativity. And that's exactly the same way of thinking. Uh, the, the fact that Einstein, you know, centuries later, put the speed of light in there and came up with something that radically affected our uh, intuition more so. But still, it's exactly the same concept. Oh, absolutely. And it goes to the heart of classical mechanics, the system that Isaac Newton eventually set up because his famous equation, we're allowed to talk about equations here, Robert, because there's a lot of equations in the book. So I love them. I love them. I keep them coming. The most famous equation in classical physics is F equals MA, force equals right. mass times acceleration. My old physics professors used to joke, if you had not studied for the test, as long as you know F equals MA, you can work everything out. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason behind the joke is very, I mean, you gotta think about what that's saying. Force equals mass times acceleration. If you know the force, force due to gravity or because you're pushing it or whatever, you can figure out how fast something's accelerating. And the acceleration is the derivative of the velocity, the rate of change of the velocity, and the velocity is the rate of change of the position. So the idea is there's two things you have to give me, position and velocity, then Newton automatically gives you the next one, the acceleration. And from that, you can figure out everything. You put the total uh, energy uh, equation, very simple. Everybody can understand this as potential energy plus kinetic. And I want you to ex explain that briefly because that will affect some, many of the other major um, uh, principles and equations that we'll later discuss. It is, and you know, it's one of those things that you just blurt out when you're taking physics. There's kinetic energy, potential energy, add them up. But there's a lot of subtlety there if you dig into it. Number one, there's this thing called energy, which remains constant. And if you're a little bit skeptical, you can ask yourself, what do you mean there's something energy that remains constant? Like if I see some energy disappearing, you're just gonna tell me it went into a different form of energy. Like, is there any content to this? But the answer is yes, there is content to it because you can attach equations to each of the different parts of the energy, the different components. And in this simple example we look at in this chapter, there's kinetic energy, which is the energy associated with moving, the energy that depends on your velocity. And there's potential energy, which is the energy ha you have whether or not you're moving, the energy that just depends on your position. So your height above ground, for example, affects your kinetic, uh, affects your potential energy, sorry. You could turn it into kinetic energy by jumping off the roof, but that's not always an advisable thing. <laughs> Um, several of the concepts that you put forth here, again, are, are basic principles that will be needed to explain more complex a aspects. So just briefly describe the importance of oscillations, harmonic oscillations, perturbation theory, and phase space. So uh, three nice <laughs> big categories for you to jump into and, and tell us what they are. Yeah, there's a lot going on there. Let me do phase space first, because it's kind of simple, but again, it's one of those simple things that's going to keep turning up and you're going to have to realize that it was more important than you thought. So we think about space, right? There's lots of definitions to space and we use the word in physics and math books in a kind of haphazard way, but the ordinary space where we live, three-dimensional space, a set of all these locations where things can be, okay? That's one way of thinking about three-dimensional space. But Newton's laws tell you that in order to know what's going to happen next, you need to know both the position of something and its velocity, or even better, its momentum. Momentum and velocity, as far as Newton are, is concerned, are just interchangeable because P equals MV, momentum equals mass times velocity. So there's another space we can think about. We can think about the space of all positions and velocities. So a six dimensional space for a single particle, because there's three dimensions of location, three dimensions of momentum, okay? That's phase space, this six dimensional space for one particle. What if you have two particles? Well, there's three numbers for one particle for its location, three for its momentum, three for the other particle for its location, and three for its momentum. So it's a 12 dimensional space. And among other things, not only is it a physically important quantity, but I'm warming up the reader to get used to bigger dimensional spaces overall, okay? So, so let me ask a specific question yeah. about phase space, which is my personal question when I was reading through. 
Um, and that is you use Avogadro's number, which is six times 10 to the 23rd, which is the number of molecules or atoms in a mole, a, a standard unit of, of stuff. Um, and then you say the phase space is 3.6 times 10 to the 24th. So it's just one order of magnitude more than that. And that confused me. I know Avogadro's number. I know what phase space <laughs> means, but to have them actually so close to one another surprised me. Well, no, that's clearly my fault. I did a bad job of explaining because the point is simply that each particle in Avogadro's number of, of particles, that's six times 10 to 23 particles. For each of those particles, there's a six dimensional phase space. So the total phase space is just six times Avogadro's ah. number. Okay. Okay. Oh, I see it. 3.6 is six times is six. Times six. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> very, very good. All right. So quickly on oscillations and perturbation theory. This was actually secretly my favorite part of the book because it's, again, hugely important in how physicists actually work, but we don't tell you. You know, We tell you about the simple harmonic oscillator, which is this idea that in a potential energy function that looks like a parabola, V of X goes like X squared, okay? So it's like the bottom of a hill. You can rock back and forth with a, a frequency that doesn't depend on your amplitude. No matter how fast you're rocking back and forth, it takes the same amount of time in a simple harmonic oscillator. That's the simple thing that we tell everybody. What we don't tell you is, if you zoom in close enough to the bottom of any potential energy, it always looks like a simple harmonic oscillator. There's non-simple, non-harmonic things, but they can be ignored in the spherical cow spirit. So <laughs> when particle physicists, when you take your first class on quantum field theory and try to understand why a quantized field looks like particles, the answer is because they look like simple harmonic oscillators. And we will get to that in book two. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we'll talk, talk about that later. And then perturbation theory, which you talked about a little bit before, simplifying and then adding the complexities at the end. Exactly. So when you go in that potential energy, you go zoom in down near the bottom and you realize, oh, it looks like a simple harmonic oscillator. And you solve that exactly. And you're very proud of yourself. And then someone, maybe it's your professor, comes along and says, OK, now what about the fact that it's not exact? Let's put back in all the things you just ignored when you were zooming in in that potential. And perturbation theory is a way of doing that systematically. There's an X squared potential, which is the simple harmonic oscillator, then there are contributions that look like X cubed, X to the fourth, X to the fifth, X to the sixth. And you can systematically learn how those affect the motions of the particles using perturbation theory. And perturbation theory, obviously, in particle physics and the later development of the standard model became exceedingly important. We wouldn't have the standard model of particle physics without that. Every time you see a Feynman diagram, those little squiggly lines of particles yep. bumping into each other, that's a perturbation theory calculation. Now, um, the way I see the, the, the principle towards which this dynamic chapter uh, um, drives is the principle of least action. Yep. And then we, you get into the Lagrangian. So tell me about the Lagrangian. Uh, equation is getting a little bit more complicated, but but it, it's it's we've set we've set the the foundation for it, so it should be very easy to to, to explain based on that principle of least action. Yeah, and this is something where you know I struggled with this one in writing, and not because it's hard to write, but because I felt like I was undoing some of the good I had done in the previous chapter. Yes. You know, in the previous chapter, I rambled on about the Laplacian paradigm. You tell me what's happening at a moment. And then I tell you what's happening next, and then that can accumulate. The principle of least action says, that's not the only way to do physics. There's a whole nother way, which says, you give me where the system starts and where it ends. You don't tell me how fast it's moving. I can figure that out by looking at what is called the action, which is a quantity that, is, that happens over the trajectory of the particle. I imagine all possible trajectories. And what I notice is the real one, the one that the laws of physics says actually say actually happens is the one that minimizes that action. And again, these are words that if you're lucky, you might hear in a popular physics book. I'm going to give you the equation that tells you what the action is. We've already talked about the kinetic energy and the potential energy. You add them together to get the energy. What if you subtracted them? <laughs> what if you took the kinetic energy minus the potential energy? That's a quantity we can define. It's called the Lagrangian. 
and the action is just the accumulation of the Lagrangian over the whole history of the particle. So in other words, the integral of the Lagrangian over time is the action. And the minimum value of the action is the real motion of the particle. So if you think about that physically, the Lagrangian is kinetic energy minus potential. We're trying to minimize that. So that's trying to minimize the kinetic energy and also minimize minus the potential energy, which means maximize the potential energy. So there's sort of one influence that wants the particle to go up to the top of the hill where the potential energy is maximized. The problem is that costs kinetic energy because you have to move up there, but you're also trying to keep the kinetic energy low. So there's a competition between these two effects and it balances out to give you the real motion a la Newton's laws of physics. So to me, this was a, a terrific part of the book because it really explained uh, uh, the, the, the deep meaning of the equation because uh, on its surface, easy to understand where energy is kinetic energy plus potential energy. But to get your head around what's the, the meaning, the, the physical meaning of kinetic energy, the energy of motion minus the potential energy, the energy of position, not immediately obvious from that statement that that makes any sense at all. No. And, you know, one of the things I got to apologize for is I just say it in the book. I, I could, if, if I wanted to write a book that was twice the length, show you, derive the fact that starting with this idea of the Lagrangian and the action, you get out Newton's laws. But I'm just hoping that you understand what the idea is without the derivation. And it's worth doing both because it's intrinsically cool. Like once you read yeah. it, you're like, wow, physics is awesome, right? But then also, again, once we get to modern physics, it's Lagrangian, Lagrangian, Lagrangian all the way down. That's what uh, all quantum field theory That's is from start to finish. So you're laying a foundation for future success. Yeah, and, and the key to understand that is you're not defining energy, you're defining this principle of least action. And that's yeah. why you have, as you said, this tension between kinetic and potential energy, because you're you're seeking this other way of doing physics by finding th this this basic principle. Yeah, and you know it's perfectly okay to take a breath at this point in the book because kinetic energy, even though there's an equation for it, in some sense you can see it. You can see the thing moving, right? And potential energy, in some sense, you can see it. It's on the top of the hill or on the bottom of the hill. You can't see the Lagrangian, kinetic minus <laughs> potential energy. That's right. just not yes. a, a tangible, right. immediate right. thing. So it's nevertheless crucially important to physics. So the reader has to sort of, you know, uh, put on their big boy pants and say, like, I'm going to understand this slightly abstract thing. Right. I, and I, as I said, to, to me, that was one of the highlights of the book because it really emphasized that um, that deeper understanding and that becomes the foundation for all of modern physics. Right. OK, at that at that point, you we kind of switch uh, from the foundations to the big concepts of space and time. So next chapter was on space. So I'm going to ask you a very simple question. Is space a thing in itself? Or is it just changes in the distance or relationships of other things? Well, that's a very good question, as you know, since you read the book. But that was the big debate between uh, one of the big debates between Isaac Newton and Leibniz at the time. Substantialism, space is a thing, a container where everything else is located, versus relationalism. Space is just a convenient way of talking about distances between two things. And I think that the modern view is much closer to substance than relation. We really think of space as a thing in and of itself, especially once you get to general relativity and space can have a geometry. If it weren't a thing, how could it have a shape, right? But, you know, again, we don't know the, fi the final laws of physics. We're still working toward that. And one of the reasons why I think it's important to remember these centuries old debates is because they have a way of coming back. And there's a point of view within modern quantum gravity that says we should think relationally once again. And since we don't know the final answers, it's good to keep all the options in mind. Now, in this chapter, we introduce, you introduce uh, Hamiltonian mechanics. And so we had this Newtonian, Lagrangian. Now we're at ha Hamil uh, Hamiltonian mechanics, which elevates momentum. So give us that sense. 
Yeah, and this is another tricky one, but it's one that I just love because it absolutely does not get explained even to physics students who are learning about Hamiltonians. The idea is the following. Maybe if you were reading about the Laplacian paradigm very, very carefully, so you're given the position and the velocity, you predict what happens next, right? You're given information at one moment in time, you predict what the next moment will hold. But wait a minute. The velocity is a rate of change of the particle's position over time. To calculate the velocity, you kind of have to peek ahead a little bit, right? If it's at one location one moment, it's at a different location the next moment. So is it cheating to include the velocity as being defined simply at a moment of time? And Hamiltonian mechanics definitively answers that question, but it does so in a way that the nomenclature is not great. So it says, think of the momentum instead of the velocity. We have a relationship between momentum and velocity. Momentum is mass times velocity, but forget that relation. And this is the hard part, because once you've learned it, it's very hard to forget. Just imagine yeah. there's something called momentum, okay? There's some vector that every particle has, and there's something called position that every particle has. And then the Hamiltonian way of doing physics says there are equations of motion one of which says the rate of change of momentum is basically F equals MA. The other is that the rate of change of position is momentum divided by mass. In other words, momentum equals mass times velocity, right? So the, I hope I got that right. I think I might've said that wrongly. Yeah, the rate of change of position is momentum divided by mass. I got it right, good. <laughs> Anyway, the point is it goes back to change versus dynamics, right? Change is any way that things could change. Dynamics is the real actual thing that things do. Hamiltonian mechanics says momentum is a conceptually independent idea from velocity, but they are proportional to each other in the real trajectories that physical systems actually do. Okay, so if that's the case, then what is the fundamental difference between the Lagrangian and the Hamiltonian? You know, the Lagrangian, the Hamiltonian, and even the original Newtonian version of classical mechanics, these are all almost exactly mathematically identical. There's some nitpicks and footnotes we don't need to worry about there, but they're equivalent both in terms of what you need to make a prediction and what those predictions are. But I have this wonderful quote from Richard Feynman in there. I'm gonna mangle the exact thing, but to paraphrase it, he says, theories can be exactly identical in their predictions, but be psychologically different in how you would move beyond them. Uh, so Hamiltonian, Lagrangian, Newtonian ways of thinking about classical mechanics give the same predictions, but they have different concepts in them. And again, as I keep saying over and over again, we don't know the final answers. So one of the reasons to let people in on all these alternatives is to prepare them for what might come next. The other is that they're put to use in even in things we already do understand. Those Lagrangians and actions are all over quantum field theory. The Hamiltonian is all over ordinary quantum mechanics. The Schrodinger equation, which we're gonna to get to eventually, is absolutely centrally dependent on the idea of the Hamiltonian. Yeah, and, and the, that was my next uh, uh, question, and the importance of Hamiltonians in, in modern quantum mechanics is, is foundational. Well, that's exactly right. And you know, again, the Hamiltonian is one of these conceptually slippery things. What is it? It's just the energy. That's what it is, but it's very specifically the energy as a function of positions and momenta. So when you say in ordinary Newtonian mechanics, the kinetic energy is one half mv squared, one half the mass times the velocity squared. That's equivalent to saying it's one half p squared over m because p the momentum is m times v, right? But in the Hamiltonian point of view, you have to say it's one half p squared over m. You're not allowed to say one half mv squared because the Hamiltonian is a function of the momentum, not of the velocity. You end the chapter on space with uh, a, a, a discussion or a presentation of fields, and you call fields the fundamental building blocks of reality. So give us some color of that. Yeah, again, as far as we know currently, but it crept up on us, you know, Laplace had this idea of a gravitational potential field. The idea there is he was trying to address this mystery that Newton had worried about, action at a distance, right? Newton says the gravitational force depends on the inverse of the square of the distance between two objects. And people, including Newton himself said, 
how does it know? <laughs> how does the planet know how far away the sun is to know what its gravitational force is supposed to be? And Newton is like, that's a really good question. I hope someday people figure it out. I don't know the answer. <laughs> Laplace said, imagine there is a field pervading all of space in between the sun and the planets. And a field just means it has a value at every position. Then he comes up with an equation, which again, gives you exactly the same predictions as Newtonian gravity does, but it's conceptually different because now there's a field filling space, which seems to fit our intuition a little bit better. And indeed, we get Maxwell coming up with electrodynamics in the mid 19th century, Einstein putting general relativity, his theory of curved space time as a theory of a metric tensor field, and all of modern particle physics is based on quantum field theory. So Laplace had the right intuition that imagining a field is a really, really useful way of thinking about the fundamental nature of stuff. Next chapter, naturally following from space, is time. I'm going to ask you the same question. Is time a thing in itself, or is time just changes in the sequence and duration of other things? Well, of course, soon enough, namely the chapter after this, we'll learn that the modern point of view is that time is part of space-time. And I think that it's right to think of space-time as a thing in and of itself, at least provisionally. That's the best we know right now. So yeah, time is a thing. No worries. <laughs> um, compare space and time before we combine before we unify them if you compare them how are they alike and how are they not alike yeah i go a lot in the book in comparing how time and space are similar and also how they're different they're similar because we can measure them right their distances they help us locate ourselves in the universe when you meet somebody you tell them where you're going to meet them and when you're going to meet them they're different, obviously, because unlike space, time has a direction. And I wrote a whole book on this. That was from eternity to here. People can read that. So we give the ultra condensed version of the arrow of time, the fact that entropy is increasing from the past to the future. If there were no change, could there still be time? Well, you wouldn't have invented it, but then again, you wouldn't exist because without change, there's no such thing as people. <laughs> okay. Um, let's talk about reversibility. Um, compare reversibility versus time reversal invariance. You do that nicely in the book. Yeah, it's something that doesn't get enough attention, I think. Again, I'm sort of like doing all my own favorite things, you know, trying to correct the misimpressions that I see uh, lying around there in the literature. So reversibility, which doesn't get a lot of press, but is the most important thing, is the foundation of that Laplacian paradigm, the conservation of information. If you know the state of the system now, you use the laws of physics to predict what will be in the future. And if you know the, law, the state of the system in the future, you can say what it was now. That's reversibility. You can go backward and forward. Time reversal invariance is supposed to be a symmetry where you simply reverse the direction of time. Okay, so in the definition of reversibility that I gave you, there was no past involved, right? But time reversal says let t, the time variable, go to minus t. And what I argue is that we, we make a big deal in modern particle physics about time reversal being violated. But I say that has nothing to do with the arrow of time because you've just chosen a particularly contentious definition of what you mean uh -huh. by time reversal invariance that are better definitions in which it is perfectly well conserved. I can see people uh, kind of getting ready to argue with you a little bit. It's a controversial area to be sure. As long as now, they buy the book. <laughs> that's the point of the book. You <laughs> it, mentioning the arrow of time, you deal with this a lot. You dealt with it in the previous book on entropy and the arrow of time. But I noticed you call the arrow of time an epiphenomenon, which means it's like the foam on a wave. It, it's not the wave itself. It looks like it's something, but it really ain't. <laughs> well, it's obviously crucial, impor crucially important to how we experience time. The fact that the past and future are different is the most obvious fact about anything in the world. And it's kind of a mystery that it's nowhere to be found in the fundamental laws of physics. And the resolution to that mystery, which is perfectly resolvable, is that the arrow of time doesn't depend on the fundamental laws. It depends on the specific state of our universe. In particular, the fact that near the Big Bang, 14 billion years ago, the entropy, the disorderliness of the universe was very, very, very low. And it's increasing ever since. And that's where the difference between past and future comes from. So it depends on the stuff in the universe, not on the underlying laws.
So I'm trying to wrap my head around that. And, and th is that worthy enough or is it minimalized enough to call it an epiphenomena? And the, and the foam on the wave sort of uh, sort of uh, 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 an <laughs> analogizes with that. So I, I'll, I'll, I'll go along with that for a while. I'll think about it. Distinguish between uh, presentism, where only the present is real, eternalism, where the past, present and future is real, which is Einstein's block universe. Uh, versus possibilism, if I pronounce that right, uh, where the past and present are real, but the future is still open. Yeah, these are different philosophical stances one can have toward the reality of different moments of time. Presentism says only now is real, like you said. Block universe or eternalism treats every moment as real. And people always trip up on this because they we're so stuck in the arrow of time in the present moment that they say, you're saying that the future exists right now? No, I'm saying the future exists. It doesn't exist right now. It exists in the future, but all moments are supposed to be equal in eternalism. And then possibilism is supposed to split the difference by saying that because the past is in the books, because we can't change it, whereas the future is something we can affect, we're going to call real both the present and the past but not the future. I'm an eternalist myself, but I want to, again, lay out all the possibilities for people to decide. Good, good. I, I'm, uh, um, I, I would skew towards possibilism, but uh, you know, it, it's worth the exercise of comparing the three gives yeah. you a deeper sense of, of, what, of what your own feeling would be and your own intuition would be and, and gives you appreciation for the, the other possibility because th this is the type of question where you feel your intuition is obviously correct and everyone else is obviously wrong until you understand it. So we, we could use that same um, uh, humility in politics, but that's, that's a different topic. <laughs> uh, what can physics say about a, a philosophical approach to time, which is the differentiation between uh, perdurantism and endurantism, perdurantism, where all objects are considered to be four-dimensional objects or worms that worms its way through four-dimensional time, and objects have temporal parts. So you can't define an object without defining its temporal part. You, you have to right. define a period, a, 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 a part of it that's, temp that's part of the object, where endurantism says that all objects are three-dimensional objects. You don't have to have the time as, as an inherent part of the object itself, but the object is present in whole at each individual time. Is, is that a, a difference without a distinction? Is it, uh, and what can physics say about it, if anything? You know, I actually think that it matters. I don't talk about that distinction in the book, but it is an important one. And one of the reasons why it matters is because, again, we're constantly trying to push beyond what we currently know. What physics has to say to philosophy is, here's what happens in the world. And then philosophers have the job of sort of conceptually making sense of it all. So this is a great question because you might think, oh, it doesn't matter. You know, objects persist over time, whether I call them each moment a different object or whether I call the whole four-dimensional thing an object, who cares? But then you have the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics where the thing can persist in time and then now become two things in two different worlds. What do you do then? And I think that... Being ready to attack all those issues philosophically is something that you can absolutely help yourself toward by understanding the physics as best you can. We'll talk about the many worlds interpretation, which I think we'll probably disagree on when you have book two. Book two, <laughs> yes. Space time is the next, next chapter. And um, uh, we've talked about space and time, the unification. Many people know that. But you talk about a difference between a flip between the shortest distance to the longest time. So I thought that was a, a very short way to, to get some deep understanding. Yeah, and you know, I'm just sharing with everybody the little epiphanies I had along the road to understanding this stuff. Uh, yeah, that's a great part of the book, by the way, to, to, to have your insights. What, what are the kinds of things that, that made a difference to you? Uh, that, that's a great part of the book, a, a real value. Thank you. Thank you very much. And when it comes to space time, which is the, just the topic of special relativity, basically, uh, the thing that Einstein put a capstone on in 1905, my feeling is that a lot of people get confused because the deep lesson of space time is talk about space time. 
don't talk about space and time separately. Those are human conveniences. The real thing is space time. But when we learn about special relativity in a typical popularization of it, we learn about time dilation and length contraction. And these are all things that are hanging on to the ideas of space and time as fundamental. If you think of space time as fundamental and you, you're told that there is something called the interval in space time, and just like a distance in space, there's a formula for it. Just a distance in space on an XY grid is given by Pythagoras's theorem, right? X squared plus Y squared equals the distance between two points. There's a formula just like that in space time. The big difference is there's a minus sign that separates the spatial contribution from the time contribution. So you have an interval that you measure on your clock the proper time from one moment to another and it's the amount of time coordinate that gets elapsed minus the amount of spatial distance you do and that's the whole difference between space and space time G give some more color to that what 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 is what does that mean well think about the famous twin paradox thought experiment which is not a paradox at all, but you have two twins, which is convenient because they're the same age. One stays home on Earth, Alice. The other one, Bob, goes out on a spaceship at 99% the speed of light and comes back. And what happens is when they come back, Alice is now a lot older than Bob, even though they were born at the same time. What happened? Oh my goodness, how can we ever understand this? The answer is they moved on different paths through space time. So Alice's age, what she actually measured on her calendar or wristwatch or whatever timekeeping device she had is just the number of years that we sort of have on our universal calendars that we all use. Whereas Bob has that amount of time squared, because it's like Pythagoras's theorem, minus all the spatial distance he went out and came back squared. So you know, just from that kind of formula, that the prediction is whoever moves out and comes back will be younger when they come back, they will experience less time because it's time squared minus space squared. So that always makes you experience less time. And that absolutely confirms that space and time are a single thing. Well, it confirms that it's a useful way of thinking about it. The other amusing historical story is Einstein put all this together in 1905. In 1907, it was Hermann Minkowski who had previously been one of Einstein's professors at university. And it was Minkowski who said, you know, this all becomes simpler if you think of your theory as unifying space and time together. And Einstein said, eh, that seems like sort of a mathematical distraction from the real physical importance. It took him a little while, but he eventually realized, you know, you had the space time point of view is really helpful. What are some common fallacies when you, one thinks about special relativity, general relativity, Lorentzian contractions? Oh, you know, I think that it depends on who's doing the thinking, but uh, I, I think that the, I don't think it's a matter of fallacies so much as a matter of ways of thinking that in some construal are okay, but lead you astray in other places. And, and my favorite one is just the idea that clocks move more slowly when you're traveling faster, when you're traveling close to the speed of light. Uh, so Bob went out there in his ship. He came back right near the speed of light. He is now younger. So you say, well, clearly his clock was moving more slowly. But remember the word relativity in the theory of relativity. You have to say, relative to what was his clock moving more slowly? For him, everything was perfectly normal. The number of heartbeats per wristwatch tick of the clock is exactly the same as it always would have been. So I don't like to say, the time moves more slowly. I think the time moves at one second per second, no matter what you're doing. The next chapter on geometry and why it's uh, important, uh, we know certainly in general relativity. Uh, I'm going to only ask you one question from this uh, chapter, and that is give me a simple way to understand the metric tensor. Good. I mean, and this is, you know, there's a lot of conceptual abstract leaps we make in the book, and I hope to sort of make them as gentle as possible. This is a mathematical leap into the world of tensors. And in some sense, they're not that hard. You know, you can think of a vector pointing in some direction in space, or you can think of it as a list of components. There's the amount of vector in the X direction, in the Y direction, in the Z direction. So a little column of three numbers, the X component, the Y component, the Z component. 
a tensor is just rather than a column of three numbers, maybe a square matrix, a three by three array or a four by four array once we get into space time. And why do you have to make that extra leap of complication? Well, because you're trying to conceptualize all of the different ways that a mathematical entity like space time can be curved. You know, there's only one way to be flat. Being flat is being flat. Be, it has no curvature anywhere. But then you say, I have some curvature. There's a million different ways in which you could have curvature. So the metric tensor tells you the distance along every possible curve you can draw in a curved space or space time. And that's enough to fully fix the geometry of it. So this was Einstein's great realization that by manipulating and thinking about that metric tensor, he could figure out an equation that said how space and time are curved. And that, of course, is general relativity, which leads us to the next chapter, a very important one on, on gravity. And I, I want to start by asking this question. Um, this is not original. I've heard it, I've heard it uh, 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 said before that is it, and, I'm, and I don't know if this is right, I'm, I'm asking you, is it true that if Einstein had not put forth special relativity in 1905, someone else would have done it very soon. But if Einstein had not put forth general relativity in 1915, it might have been a very long time before someone else would. I think the first part of that is certainly true. Um, special relativity was really a group project very much. Einstein was the final person to put the finishing touches on it. And in fact, in some sense, the hard mathematical work had been done. We understood what are called Lorentz transformations and the ways that lengths and times might change. And what Einstein really added to it was the idea that you can get rid of this thing lurking in the background called the ether. People thought that light waves propagated through a medium called the ether. And it was Einstein who realized you didn't need that. You could get all the answers. All you had to do was change your notions of space and time, which is a lot, you know, it, it, admittedly. But people like Poincaré and Lorentz and so forth were on the track of that kind of understanding. I think that someone would have come up with it if Einstein hadn't. Now, it took 10 years for Einstein to turn that into general relativity. And it was certainly his, you know, capstone achievement. And it wouldn't have happened in 10 years if Einstein hadn't been around. It would have been longer than that. But how much longer? I don't know. You know, David Hilbert came up with Einstein's equation almost the same time as Einstein did. Now, admittedly, he was good friends with Einstein. Einstein told him everything he had done. <laughs> uh, but there were other people. Uh, Gunnar Nordstrom uh, was another physicist working on the same kind of problem. It was really, really hard. And Einstein was smarter than everybody else. But I, I don't think it would have taken decades. It would have taken years. Okay. Uh, you make the point that inertial mass and gravitational mass are different, but it's significant that, that they, that there are two different definitions, but they're the same thing. What's the significance of that? Yeah, I'd like to analogize it, analogize it rather with uh, electromagnetism, where you have the force on an electrically charged particle depends on its charge. And then you have the inertia on that particle depends on its mass. So its acceleration by F equals MA, forces mass times acceleration, depends on both its charge and its mass. And the charge can be positive or negative, right? In a single electric field, electrically charged positive particles will move one direction and negatively charged particles move the other direction. But in gravity, the same quantity, the mass, is both the measure of inertia and what you might think of as the charge, right? The amount of gravity we produce depends on your mass. The response we have to gravity depends on your mass. So the mass just cancels out of all the equations. And this is Galileo's insight. Two objects with different masses will fall at the same rate if we ignore air resistance and all those things. One of the great... Um visions of uh, general relativity and gravity in putting the whole story together is the the total mass energy of the universe and how it came about. And the idea that the universe could have come about out of nothing, however we define nothing, that's a that's another closer to truth <laughs> subject that you and I have <laughs> talked a lot about. Um, the, the, the fundamental idea enabling that is that gravity is considered negative energy and somehow balances the mass energy of the universe so that uh, 
if the total mass uh, zero energy universe model, if it's a flat model, a Euclidean model that's not hyperbolic and it, it's not curved, the total amount of energy in the universe is exactly zero in that the amount of positive energy in the form of matter energy is exactly canceled out by the negative energy in the form of gravity. Now, I can understand that, uh, but then I think that energy, uh, gravity is a something, and how, do, how does that, how is that, I mean, it's a force, so how is it negative? How is gravity considered negative energy? It sounds like a cheat that you physicists do. <laughs> no, no, no. It's actually quite common in physics. Remember, if you if you have a ball on a hill and you say, I can define the energy of that ball, right? Like the zero point of energy doesn't matter. All that matters is how energy changes. So if I have a ball right here and I assign it a certain amount of energy, down here it has a negative amount of energy. There's nothing weird about that. The zero point doesn't matter. So for gravity, what happens is simply if I have two objects that are orbiting each other, let's say, right? Well, I can extract energy from that system by letting them spiral closer together. This literally happens when black holes give off gravitational radiation. So the gravitational force between them is larger when they're nearby, but the energy of the system is lower because it's given away energy to the rest of the universe. So it has increased the amount of negative energy in the gravitational field. And that balances out by the gravitational waves that have been detected. That's the energy exactly. that, that's going out. Okay, that's, that's right. a very, very fundamental point. The last chapter of this fabulous book uh, is on black holes, and it's very natural. It's the ultimate test bed of, uh, of theoretical physics. Um, and I, I know this to be a fact, but I still hard to get my brain around it, that crossing the event horizon beyond which uh, you can't return, light can't come out of that, we know what the event horizon is for black holes, is a moment in time, not a location in space. So then it becomes impossible to avoid the singularity to which you're pulled. Uh, but the reason it is, you can't avoid the singularity is, is that it's a, 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 a point in your future and it's like trying to avoid tomorrow. So yeah, I, I understand what that correct. means, Wonderful. but I, I have difficulty <laughs> accepting that it's true. Sure. And this is sort of the payoff chapter. I mean, you've worked really hard, okay? You've read all these chapters, all these equations, and in the previous two chapters on geometry and gravitation, it's really been a different kind of math than you've probably been exposed to with the tensors and all that. But what it allows us to do is to talk about something like black holes in a way that you just couldn't do without the equation. So this is your reward for making it this far. And also it drives home a very important lesson because the equations are smarter than we are. You know, Albert Einstein put forward general relativity in 1915. He lived for another 40 years or so. He never knew what a black hole was. You know, the idea would have been alien to him because it was really hard to get our brains around, but the equations knew it was there. Yeah, you know, the, the idea of a black hole was implicit in Einstein's equation and in the solution to Einstein's equation written down by Carl Schwarzschild just two years later. So this idea that the center, what we think of as the center of the black hole, R equals zero, the singularity, is a moment in time in the future, no one would have guessed that. It is something that you just get out of the equation. So you can write down the equation, you can point to it and you go, look right here, it's telling you the singularity is in your future and you're going to hit it. And you can draw pictures to understand it after the fact, but you have to be led to that conclusion by trusting the equations. The, the alternative is that there's something wrong with the equation, something's missing, there's something more fundamental we're not getting. How can we just, how can we uh, falsify that alternative? It's always possible, you know, uh, many people have tried to out Einstein <laughs> Einstein and come up with a better theory than general relativity. I am actually personally responsible for a few efforts in those directions. <laughs> and what you want to do is not just propose a theory, but then propose predictions that can go out and be tested. And general relativity is tested to exquisite precision in many different ways. And I'm responsible for some of those also. I'm a big believer in it. So you can look here in the solar system at the motion of the planets. You can look at the deflection of light. You can look at the gravitational waves and the black holes. And you can look at cosmology and the Big Bang.
and they all fit general relativity. You can look perfect. at the GPS on your uh, iPhone. It all it's all there. And you know, again, it's it's a another testament to the fact that the theories are smarter than we are. Einstein didn't know about the Big Bang either when he wrote down the equations, but his equations correctly tell us what happens then. You talk about a white hole, and uh, we, we know what that is, is a black hole run backwards in time, but then make the interesting comment that the universe as a whole, which came out of the Big Bang, which was the singularity at the beginning, looks something like what a white hole would be. A white hole is a very theoretical thing. Nobody thinks they really exist, but the universe kind of looks like that. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of people wonder about the fact that there's so much matter and energy in the universe. Why doesn't it collapse to be a black hole? After all, Roger Penrose and Stephen Hawking became famous proving theorems that say if you get enough matter and energy in the same place, they will always make a black hole. But there is a little hidden assumption in those theorems. They don't actually say you will always make a black hole. They say that either there will be a singularity in your future, as there is in a black hole, or there will be a singularity in your past, uh. as there is in a white hole. And we have a singularity in our past. That's the Big Bang. Now, we have to say here, of course, when we use the phrase the Big Bang to talk about the singularity, that's a little bit sloppy because the singularity probably doesn't exist. That's the place where the theory breaks down, not an actual part of the history of the universe. It's a signpost saying we need to understand the fundamental nature of space and time better under exactly those conditions. Great book, uh, uh, Sean. I really enjoyed it um, and learned a lot and uh, recommend it to everyone very, very much so. Um, some, some, final, some final thoughts. Um, you talk about uh, why questions. We're, we're all answering why questions and pushing it further and further. But then you talk about why questioning bottoming out without some ultimate answers, with nowhere further to go. You have a great phrase. That's just the way it is. I, I, I've known you've Use that with me on Closer to Truth uh, in the past when I've pushed you on certain things. You, you look me in the eye and say, that's just the way it is. You know, take it or leave it. Um, <laughs> but you do it politely, though. You do it very politely. Uh, the brute fact. What, what's in that category? Well, of course, we don't know. And, and this is why it is something where we have to be careful and subtle rather than just bludgeoning our way into our favorite answer. I'm all in favor of asking why questions. My point is only that we can't demand that there be an answer that satisfies us, right? The universe is not set up for our amusement. There might be answers to any particular why question, or there might not be. So I think we need to sort of look at the kind of question we're asking. For example, the early universe has low entropy. That's where the arrow of time comes from. I would like to know why. And the answer might just be, it just is that way. It's a brute fact. But it doesn't smell that way to me because I can think of many other ways the universe could have been at early times that don't look anything like that. So it's not just there is a single fact. There is a condition picked out among many different possibilities. And I want to know why this possibility rather than the others. For other questions, like why is something is there something rather than nothing? Why is there a universe at all? There, I don't, I don't think that the question has the same character. I don't think that there could be a very good answer to that question in the terms that the question is being asked. So there, I suspect that the answer is that's just the way it is. But I'm not certain about any of that. So I'm happy to have my uh, priors overturned by better evidence. And the, the fundamentals of why are the laws of physics the way they are? I mean, that's sort of one level up from why is there something rather than nothing but those two i would put in that category at least at least right now i see that the biggest ideas in the universe is a three-part series space time and motion the first book that is just being released which i say is is fantastic uh is classical physics but it's the it's the foundation of what you need to understand all physics the second uh, will be quanta and fields, which is on quantum physics, and the third, complexity and emergence. So uh, I just want you to give us a, a tease about the future books. So what, what are some of the, the motivating um, energies that you feel to, to write each of those and why are they organize as they do? And why do you end with complexity and emergence? Well, a couple of things going on there. One is, again, I'm focusing on things we think are pretty solidly understood and established within physics. So it's not about string theory in the multiverse and black hole information or anything like that. 
Uh, but modern physics is based on this idea of quantum field theory. You take fields, a la Laplace and Maxwell and Faraday and so forth, you quantize them. It's a simple idea. Uh, there's some puzzles with it, some you know things we don't yet understand, but it's giving us spectacularly successful predictions for what we see at experiments. And so I really try to explain what quantum mechanics is, what quantum field theory is, what the different kinds of fields are, where the forces of nature come from, the Higgs boson, the fermions versus the boson, bosons, all of that stuff, and then build it up into matter, atoms, why atoms have the size they do, et cetera. Then in volume three, we go on to admit that sometimes there are interesting systems with more than just a handful of atoms, right? There are collective phenomena that have sort of an autonomous way of talking about them. You can talk about fluid mechanics without knowing your fluid is made of atoms. So I talk about cosmology, which is a simple example, but then more interesting examples about thermodynamics and statistical mechanics and complex phenomena, which physicists are still struggling to get a handle on. But we see some patterns amongst the noise, power laws and scaling relations and networks. And that's something that we do understand a little bit about now, but it's also going to be a growth area going forward. And for everyone who's looking forward to uh, quanta and fields and complexity and emergence, you had better get the, the, the first volume on space, time and motion because you won't be able to understand fully <laughs> the second and third volume without the first volume. I have a one question about emergence. Give me a really short answer, but it's one of the questions uh, that we focus on a lot. And that is, is there such a thing as what's called strong emergence? where it is impossible, even in principle, to account for certain emergent properties by reduction in terms of fundamental laws. Well, I think that reduction is always a bad way of talking about it. I never use the word reduction myself. I do think that there is a fundamental description of reality. And I think that we have part of that in hand in our best current theory of the standard model of particle physics plus gravity. I don't think that there is any phenomenon in nature that we can observe in our everyday lives that is incompatible with that theory. Of course, so there's no strong emergence from that low level, but you can always talk about strong emergence between other levels. Like if your if your quote unquote microscopic theory is human beings, and your macroscopic theory is societies or economies, then I can't make the same promises, right? Our our understanding of human beings is far far weaker than our understanding of electrons and photons and so forth. So it's possible in my mind that the best theory we have of human beings is not enough to predict what would happen in a society. You need to add some extra ingredients in some interesting way. I don't know if that's true or not, but I can at least contemplate it. Well, we'll talk a lot more about that when book three and book two come out, but everybody needs to get book one in order to understand the future. True. You have a standing <laughs> invitation to come back for each one. I say to everyone, the biggest ideas in the universe has my highest recommendation. Viewers can watch 26 of Sean's videos and eight TV episodes in which he appears on the Closer to Truth website and Closer to Truth YouTube channel. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Thanks, Robert. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing.